Hi, everyone. Uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk a lot about clothes. And I think we tend to think of clothing as sort of vapid, silly, not important. And I'm here to tell you something that you will know 100% by the time we finish tonight, that it is so much more than just clothes. And what we wear, how long we wear it, where we buy it, has a major impact on both the planet and its people. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, before we jump in, this is a really long presentation, but I'm not going to, so I'm not going to read every last detail to you, but I am going to be sharing this with all of you. You'll get it via email as a PDF, so you can go back and read more facts, check my sources. There's some helpful links and tips in here. Uh, so definitely give yourself some time to review this after this is all over tonight. So I am Amanda, and why am I such an expert? Um, I've been working in buying for almost 20 years now, specifically in fashion. I've worked for some really large and iconic fast fashion brands, including Urban Outfitters, ModCloth, Nasty Owl, a few smaller startups in there as well. Um, I am currently head of product for a family-owned chain of gift shops, but I am actually leaving that job in a week to pursue uh, consulting and close course full-time. So let's get started here with some facts. There are a lot of facts on this slide and I'm not gonna read them all to you. So all of you who are speed readers are gonna absorb them really, really fast. Um, but like I said, you're gonna get a copy of this later that you can read at your leisure and surprise and delight all your friends and family when you drop these facts at parties and other get togethers. Uh, I just wanna call out one here that is really, I think, Every time I talk about this on social media, people are shocked. And that is that on average, Americans buy about 70 new articles, brand new, of clothing each year. 70. Sounds like a lot, but really it's about one new garment every six-ish days. Um, I know you're already thinking, does that include socks? No. Does that include underwear? No. Uh, we're talking clothing, right? And in the world of fashion, things like socks and underwear are actually other categories. <laughs> I know, it's just, just how it works. Um, the thing about those 70 garments is that we are wearing, we are, I guess I would say we are wearing and using these clothes for less time than we ever have in history, which is why we're buying so many all the time. And 60% of new clothing ends up in the landfill or incinerator within the same year it was made. It can end up there because you bought it and the zipper broke right away, or you forgot about it and just kind of tossed it when you moved out. Uh, it could have been produced by the retailer and never actually sold. There's a lot of that going on too. Um, but that's 60 billion with a B garments every year that are just going in the trash. When it comes to the 70 uh, items that we buy every year, you know, a lot of us are very familiar with what happens to them when we're done. We either, like I said, toss them in the trash. That's where 85% of them go. Um, or the other 15% gets donated, right? Goes into the Goodwill bin. We drop it off at the Salvation Army or some other local thrift store. Um, what really happens there? is if we take those 70 garments that we're buying every year, and I'm going to say, if you're saying, hey, I've been actually wearing the same clothes since 1980, or I've only bought one thing in the past few years, or I only shop secondhand, or I sew all my clothes, I want you to realize that that 70 is an average. So if you bought zero brand new clothing last year, that means someone else bought 140, right? In fact, there might be people out there who are buying 200, 300 garments a year. And once again, I know that sounds really wild, but if you think about uh, like haul culture right now with people buying a lot, going into Shein and buying 10, 20 things at a time, you only have to do place 10 orders to get to 200 in a year, right? It can happen really, really fast. So of those 70 garments on average that we're buying each year, 60 will end up in the landfill. I want you to imagine 60 things hanging in your closet. Some of you may not even have 60 things hanging in your closet. So imagine all of that just going in the trash. 10 will be donated of that 70. So just a small amount. Still, it's like, okay, well, at least it's getting more life, right? 
actually, it turns out this is one of the things I've learned in the biggest and maybe most devastating way in the three years I've been working on Close Wars is that only one of those 10 garments will be purchased locally and worn again. The rest will either be shredded into industrial rags or uh, stuffing for upholstery, things like that. Uh, it may end up being bailed up and sold off to a vintage store or another seller, but the vast majority will join the massive overseas, um, international secondhand clothing trade where it will be shipped off to the global South. So most likely South America, uh, Africa, um, some parts of Asia. Um, here in the United States, a substantial portion of our clothing actually ends up in Africa where it becomes someone else's problem. Uh, and there it kind of ends up in landfills or even the ocean pretty fast. So we're, pa we're basically passing on the burden of the stuff we want to someone else. On top of that, we're making so much clothing. We're buying so much clothing. Uh, it's a huge industry. I think when people think that clothing is just this like silly little pastime or clothes don't matter, it's like, well, we actually all wear clothes and a lot of us are buying a lot of clothes and a lot of clothes are being made. So of course it's this huge industry, right? Every person on earth is wearing clothes. So this industry has a really big impact. In fact, 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the fashion industry. Uh, the fashion industry is responsible for 20% of global wastewater. And that comes from whether it's watering crops, you know, to grow cotton, to dyeing clothing. Uh, some garments are washed multiple times in different ways to change the way they feel or to change the color or to make them look broken in. There's a lot of water consumed in that process, printing fabric, printing t-shirts, so many things that involve water. Um, and the fashion industry itself actually uses more energy each year than both aviation, that means all the airplanes flying around the world day after day after day, and shipping, so boats and UPS trucks, all of that, the fashion industry is using more energy than those two combined. Um, and on top of that, like we've got workers, we're saying like, right, I get it, it's a big industry, there's a lot of clothes being made, it's having a major impact on the planet. Well, what if I told you that the industry employs at least 75 million workers worldwide. And I say at least because beyond that, there are a lot of people who just aren't accounted for or off the books. People who are working, you know, cultivating cotton or working in dye houses, people who are being paid off the books. People, I mean, there are so many examples of cotton involving forced labor throughout this world. And certainly all the people who are being forced against their will to grow and harvest cotton are not being counted in the 75 million people working in the garment industry. So, okay, we're buying 70 garments on average every year. There's having this major impact. Like what's the tipping point? Where do we need to get in terms of where we buy clothing? Okay, I'm gonna show you the number and I don't want you to faint. It's pretty shocking. We need to buy 75% less new clothing. That comes from something called Earth Logic, um, which put together this lengthy study that's basically said, like, how can we get, how can we begin to minimize the impact of fashion, dial it back, ensure that we get into a more sustainable place where our need for clothing exists within what the planet can give us? And it said, yeah, we need to buy a quarter of the clothing that we're buying right now, um, which would still be, believe it or not, at least one new item every month. It's not like total deprivation, um, but still 75% less is, is a big shift for many, many people. So I thought we could start by talking about who makes our clothing, because we already know that clothing has a major impact on the planet in terms of all the resources that are used to create it. And I know, you know, this is when we when we see most education out there or most brands talking about like sustainability, their sustainable collection, that kind of thing. They really focus on the planet, right? The environmental impact of what they're selling. 
But what doesn't, what gets left out a lot is the conversation about who makes our clothing. And what I have found over the years is that many people just assume that robots make our clothing, that machines make our clothing. But the reality is that machines do not do a great job of sewing clothing. It turns out you really need that human touch to actually create garments. And that's why more than 75 million people worldwide are employed by the fashion industry. You know, and this is this is not a great job. Uh, it's interesting to me because sewing is really hard. I don't know how many of you have tried it, how many of you do it, but sewing is very skilled. It's very hard work. It takes a toll on your eyes and your body, especially if you're doing it eight, 10, 12, even more hours every day. Um, the majority of people who are out there sewing our clothing they work without contracts. They don't have set schedules. There's mandatory overtime. They don't have the protection of labor laws. Um, and they are not paid a living wage. Now, living wage is not the same as minimum wage. In fact, in most countries, including the United States, it's kind of impossible to really make a living off of a minimum wage. Um, a living wage actually allows you to have housing, medicine, education, good food, health care, uh, and savings, right? And, you know, minimum wage uh, here in the United States doesn't even allow for that, but it's even worse in other countries. 85% of garment workers are women. Um, and that doesn't even include, you know, in my experience as a buyer, the vast majority of the corporate teams designing, buying, planning, doing production are also women. It's, it's a very female driven industry with also the primary customer on the other side of it being female, right? Um, obviously there is a wide spectrum, spectrum of gender ident identities within there, but for the sake of the way the fashion industry looks at people, they look at their customers as either men or women. And so I will sometimes speak to it that way as I talk today, just because that is how the industry really looks at gender as a binary proposition. So these workers who are making our clothing, uh, they work 10 to 16 hours each day, six days a week. Some of them live in the factory facility. Um, wage theft is really common here. You know, when, when firms are brought in to do factory inspections, one of the first things they look for, which can be a huge red flag, is whether or not someone is keeping track of hours and pay, which for many of us here in the United States seems like a no brainer, like how could that be possible? But I can tell you, I have read factory audits where no one was keeping track of how much someone was working or when they were being paid. And that is often a huge red flag that there are many other labor and safety issues going on within that factory. Sexual harassment and physical and mental abuse on the job are very common. And unfortunately, female workers are often unable to report this because one, they would lose their job. Uh, two, they may not, they may lose the potential of marriage down the road. People might look at them and say like, oh, she's trouble or she's tempting, all kinds of really bad things. So they kind of have to stay quiet. Also, their forced labor, as I mentioned, is a big part of the fashion industry throughout the world. I mean, there are examples, of course, the Uyghur Muslims in China who are curating, cultivating cotton, uh, working in factories, making clothing. They also work in a lot of the synthetic fabric mills in uh, India, there is the scam of dowry contracts where women will go out into the countryside and recruit, you know, poor rural women, young women, and bring them back to these factories where it's like, if you work here for three years, five years, whatever the terms of the contract are, at the end, we'll give you a lump sum that will be your dowry so you can get married. What of these girls who are brought into this office and don't understand is that they will be fined for every mistake they make. Anytime they're sick, if they eat too much food, they'll have no freedom to leave the factory grounds on their own. And often when they finish the program, the contract, there's very little money left for a dowry. So there is a massive environmental impact to all of this clothing, but there's also a major human impact that we don't talk about very often. I wanted to pause here. Are there any questions, Cassie? Nope, not at this time. Okay, great. So keep going. Okay, so 
One term that you've probably heard or seen is sustainable fashion. I really, uh, I prefer the term slow fashion because really what that's all about is slowing down our consumption of clothing. So buying less of it in the first place and making it last a lot longer. So we're shopping a lot less often and making a lot less sort of like spur of the moment purchases of things that we end up not really liking, which, hey, I have been there too. I used to set my alarm to wake up very early the day after Christmas so I can shop the free people 50% off sale sale and fill my cart up with a ton of stuff because the rush was great. And then I would get it and most of it was really disappointing, right? So slow fashion, sustainable fashion is really a more thoughtful approach to clothing, to our own personal style that thinks about the processes and resources required to produce clothing. So it's shopping for clothing while knowing the impact of it. And it's, trust me, it's a very different experience when you realize all this stuff. It makes shopping, what you wear every day, such a different experience. Uh, and this is really about thinking about the fair treatment of people, of animals, the planet, just thinking about what happens to the clothing we buy while we own it and after we no longer own it. And this starts with buying a lot less stuff, shopping secondhand as often as possible. We live in the golden era of secondhand shopping. We're going to talk about that more later. Wearing the same clothing over and over again. Now, you're hearing me say this in your Amanda, like I wear the same clothes all the time. I'm going to tell you, so do I, but a lot of people do not. And I do think a big part of this comes from social media, that whole like outfit of the day and influencers wearing something different every time. The sort of stigma of wearing the same dress to multiple weddings, right? To being shown in the same outfit multiple times on social media. If this sounds completely foreign to you, congratulations. I, you have avoided so much nonsense that Instagram has been serving up for the last 10 years. And I'm really, really jealous of you because this is like where we are and have been for quite some time that people feel ashamed of wearing the same outfit over and over again. And we've got we to gotta cut that out, right? And show that like wearing the same outfit all the time is actually really cool. It also means like spending our money more strategically, you know, rather than buying 10 things this week from Shein, saving up and buying one really nice thing that we're going to wear over and over again. And then when we're done shop, we're done wearing something because the truth is we're not going to wear the same clothes for our whole lives, right? Our bodies change, our lives change, our jobs change, where we live changes. Gosh, I've lived in so many different client climates over the past 10 years. Like I've had to get new clothes, right? Uh, rather than just throwing them in the trash or jamming them in the donation bin, actually working to ensure that other people get to wear them. I call that mindful rehoming. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, I made this post on Instagram a while ago, just like what the slow fashion movement is and who we are and what we do. And this really, I mean, the, we're, we're like thinking so much about laundry. We're getting things repaired. We are shopping small. We are doing everything we can to ensure that every garment and really everything we own gets the maximum use. Now, conversely, we have fast fashion, which is I'm sure you're here because you've heard that term before, right? So a lot of people, when they hear fast fashion, they think, okay, it's like really cheap. It's probably like Shein or Fashion Nova or Forever 21 or Zara or H&M. You've probably heard all of these referred to as fast fashion. And I will say, yes, they are. But there are a lot more brands out there that are fast fashion that might surprise you because fast fashion is not a specific price point. In fact, not all fast fashion is inexpensive. Uh, it's not a certain aesthetic. Sometimes I think there is this preconception that uh, fast fashion is very trendy and young, um, and it can be, but it's not always. Uh, and it's not a particular customer base, right? It's not for just people of a lower socioeconomic background. It's not just for young people. It's actually 
there are brands out, fast fashion brands out there catering to all kinds of people. You can't identify fast fashion by where you find the stores. It's not just stores that are in malls. Uh, you can't identify it for the way the store looks. That's the merchandising or even the influencers and celebrities that are associated with it. Uh, people are always surprised to learn that some brands are fast fashion. Fast fa what fast fashion is, is a business model. And the entire business model relies on selling us as much stuff as possible, as often as possible. If you've brought 70 or 140 new items of clothing in the past year, or even more than that, I'm going to tell you, I'm not surprised because that is the model that surrounds us, right? And it, as I said, like we live in a time where it's often stigmatized to wear something multiple times. Well, you're going to buy new stuff, right? So if you are, if, if when I said the 70 garments thing, you said, Oof, for me, it's actually like 300 or 140 or 75, whatever. I don't want you to feel bad. This is like a shame-free zone. We're learning now why we need to change and how to change. And we're going to do that together. So in order to get you and me and everyone else we know to buy as much stuff as possible, as often as possible, those businesses need to encourage us to over-consume, to just shop all the time. That's going to be through lots of sales and emails and social media posts. They're going to tell us that we should treat ourselves, that it's self-care, that, you know, vacation's coming. We need a whole new suitcase. We can't have clothes. We can't wear what we wore last year, that you need a new dress for every wedding that you're a guest on and on and on. The thing about this business model, not only is it encouraging us to buy way more stuff than we would ever need, which has an impact on the planet, obviously. They also are prioritizing the profits made off of this stuff over the people, the people of this planet, both the people making the clothes, but even just the people living on this planet and dealing with the ramifications of all those clothes. So fast fashion, I actually saw this play out in the time of my career. The first few years of my career, uh, I worked for Urban Outfitters, which, spoiler, is a fast fashion brand. But at the time, it didn't really engage in a lot of fast fashion-y behavior. Um, and we actually, you know, we delivered new product every month, but it wasn't just like this constant like reboot of every store and the website. Um, we took months and months to get things right. And it was a lot slower, right? But in 2008, which I was pretty early in my career, as uh, many millennials will relate to, uh, the two 2008 financial crisis began and then the recession. And what happened is that retailers, whether they were department stores or places like Urban Outfitters or anything in between, were like, oh my gosh, we have all the stuff and nobody's shopping it because people are worried. People are losing their jobs. What they had to do was mark everything down, put it on sale, kept putting it on more sale and more sale, what happened is all of us, myself included, got kind of addicted to deals, right? We were like, why would we pay full price for anything? In fact, as fast fashion became the model for retail in general, you kind of reached a point where you felt a little embarrassed buying something for full price when you knew it would go on sale soon, right? So at that time, every retailer back in 2008, 2009 was just struggling, but there were a few that weren't, and it was fast. It was Forever 21, it was H&M. These are what I think of as the original fast fashion retailers who were actually experiencing so much growth during the recession that they were opening more and more stores, expanding their stores, just growing, growing, growing. In fact, we would be in meetings at Urban Outfitters saying like, what? How do we, what do we do? Like Forever 21 is killing us, right? But if we started making our stuff the same price as Forever 21, we would look not, I don't know, we would lose like our brand cachet, right? Like we would, we wouldn't look as premium. And so the options there were to either, okay, let's reduce our prices to be like Forever 21 and possibly seem not as cool or continue to put the same prices on all of our garments but constantly put them on sale or other promos 
uh, and then people will come and buy them and thinking that thinking they're getting a great deal. That's where we went. That's where most retailers went. The problem with that was like you couldn't continue making the clothes the way you had before and sell them at these low prices all the time. So corners started to be cut. One of the biggest things that came out of that time period is we saw a huge shift into clothing becoming synthetic. So we're talking polyester uh, and other derivatives of polyester. In fact, many people think of the 70s as the golden era, golden era of polyester, but actually we're living in it right now with more than 60% of clothes being made these days made of polyester or related versions of polyester because polyester technology has gotten so good you would be hard pressed to spot it if you don't read the label you can get it in a variety of different textures weights etc and so shifting into polyester away from cotton allowed clothes to be a lot cheaper and profitable for retailers I remember when this first began, we kind of thought like, this is just a temporary thing, right? But soon we will shift back to this when the economy gets better because there's no way customers like this. Turned out customers didn't care. And so we never made that shift back. So what it allowed us to do is put a price tag on something, put a price tag on say a dress and say it's $88, but know that almost all of the, those units of that dress that we sold would really sell for $40. $40 and still be super profitable. And that's that's where the fast fashionification of all fashion began. What happened though, is like now everybody has a hot deal. So how do you get customers to come and shop for you? Well, now you have to be the first one to have every single trend. And that's where the fast came from. So in the first few years of my career, Everything we ordered shipped via boat. Like it literally came across the Pacific Ocean on a boat and, you know, in big cargo containers. And it would cost maybe if you were going to buy, let's say, a pair of shoes, uh, it's 50 cents to ship a pair of shoes in a boat. Really, really cheap, right? For clothes, it's like five, 10 cents, right? They're so little. Um, every once in a while, you would need something fast because a boat takes a couple months. If they go very slow, they go like 20 miles an hour. They got to cross the whole Pacific Ocean. They got to come into the port. They have to go through customs. They have to be unloaded and then get it on the truck. It's a long time, right? Well, every once in a while, it'd be like, this order is running behind. We need it for the catalog. We need it for this special event. And we would ask permission to fly that order in on an airplane. Now, if, remember I said a pair of shoes might be 50 cents to ship on a boat? On an airplane, $10 for each pair of shoes. So naturally, if you wanted to ship something on a plane, you had to write a whole proposal. There was a form and you would explain why and what it was going to cost. You would get all this other information, how many sales we might miss by not shipping it via air. And then an executive would have to sign off on it. And then you could book the air freight. It was a very rare thing, right? Um, in the last, I would say, six years of my career, most recently, almost everything sh ships on an airplane. And so there's this extra cost that the industry has to absorb while keeping prices low, which means that the clothes get even lower quality to be profitable, but come so fast. And they need to come so fast because if you work at H&M, you don't want Zara to get the hot new trend first, right? You've got to get it before them. And so you're like, everything's coming on the plane, right? In the past few years, I have placed orders one month before they arrived in the stores. It was that fast. I would place the order. It would get sewn. It would get on a plane and be there four weeks later. I mean, that is pretty wild. In the past, it was three to six months in advance. Um, so, you know, in addition to this driving down the quality of clothing, because we're spending so much time to put it on an airplane, uh, it also means that the carbon footprint of this industry has e expanded exponentially because obviously like going on an airplane, much higher carbon footprint than going on a boat. Uh, I will just tell you one little like weird, interesting, maybe depressing fact is Zara has actually gotten around a lot of this air freight expense by they still ship a lot via boat. But what happens is the garments are like mostly finished when they get on the boat. And then they have teams of people finishing the garments, like the sewing on the boat as it comes across the ocean. So they're 
But if they do that, they can get it in almost as fast as completing the production overseas and flying it. The thought of sewing on a ship all day, well, I get motion sick, so I don't know if I could do it, but it's pretty, pretty wild, right? In 2023, here's the thing. Most big retailers and brands operate using the fast fashion model. Uh, anthropology, fast fashion, free people, fast fashion, Madewell, J. Crew, Old Navy, most of the stuff at Nordstrom, Macy's, Target, Amazon, uh, Revolve. I could go on and on fast fashion. Um, and what makes this even wilder to me, are you ready for a really mind-blowing fact? Clothes are less expensive now than they were in the 1990s. Uh, whereas everything is so much more expensive. I mean, my rent is so much more expensive than it was five years ago, but clothes are actually cheaper now for us as customers than they were in the 1990s, which, you know, was a long time ago. Uh, are there any questions, Cassie? No questions, no, but this okay. is fascinating. <laughs> oh, good, good. Okay, good. Um, I try to be thorough. <laughs> so fast fashion is known for its deals, right? I mean, maybe even anthropology, for example, which is one that when I tell people it's fast fashion, it gives them the vapors. We got to get out the smelling salts you know, rejuvenate them right there. Uh, even anthropology has some pretty wild blowout sales, right? But then there are places like Shein or Amazon. Gosh, some of the clothes on Amazon are so inexpensive. I mean, it's such a deal. You know, Amazon is the number one retailer of clothing in the United States. More people are buying their clothes from Amazon than anywhere else. So people buy these clothes because they are as ostensibly a good deal, but they really aren't. And this is something that I saw play out throughout my career as the clothes, the actual quality of them got worse and worse and worse. As I mentioned, at least 60% of clothing made today is polyester, about 70% in total is synthetic because we've also got acrylic, nylon, that kind of stuff. Lots and lots of blends. Uh, by the way, if I haven't mentioned, polyester is plastic. It's made from fossil fuels and it is not biodegradable. And so when it goes to the landfill, it just sits there for centuries. You know, I had a really, I don't know, a, a dark period in about 2020 when I learned a lot about plastic and recycling. And one very dark thing I learned about plastic, and this includes polyester, is that no one actually knows really how long it takes any of the stuff to break down in a landfill because plastic and polyester, none of that stuff has been around long enough. They can model it based on how stuff breaks down in a laboratory setting, but landfills don't work the same way because they're piling stuff on stuff on stuff on stuff. The further down something is, the longer it takes to break down because it's not getting oxygen. But what we do know about plastics, polyesters, other synthetic fabrics, is that when they break down, they release really toxic chemicals and gases that get into water supply, into soil. Some of them are like picked up. I'm sure you've heard of microplastics as the stuff breaks down, little tiny plastics. They blow in the wind, they go in the ocean, fish eat them, we eat the fish, the plastic is in our guts. The average person eats multiple credit cards worth of plastic every year inadvertently because of things like that. Um, so we saw this big shift into these synthetics in this century. We also saw zippers, buttons, hooks, snaps all become lower quality. I don't know about you, but for me, the amount of, I don't really wear pants. I just wear a dress every day. The amount of bad zipper nightmares I have had as an adult, because the zippers were crappy, I've had to be stapled into my clothes at work so that I wasn't giving everybody a show because the zipper malfunctioned or I wore something once and the zipper just fell out or lost all its teeth. I'm sure so many of you have repressed negative experiences like this. Um, but we also saw details leave. So I don't know about you, but almost no garments I ever buy, have, like dresses, have pockets in them. And that's not because... Uh, there's like this grand conspiracy to make us buy purses. Although now that I mention it, it might be true. Uh, it's because pockets are expensive. They cost a couple dollars to sew and add a pocket. 
And retailers, they can't afford that with the kind of profit margin they're trying to make while offering you these low prices. Uh, lining is another one. I remember specifically when I was working at ModCloth and then went on to Nasty Gal, they're two very different customers. And at ModCloth, we were really into like, everything needs to be lined. Nothing can be transparent. And it really drove up our prices and there was a lot of negotiating. But when I went to Nasty Gal, we were like, no, everything can be sheer. People can wear little shorts underneath, whatever. And the price difference was massive. And I do think this idea, there was this trend for like, I don't know, four or five years. It was totally started with the Kardashians still going on where you wear something sheer and just like underwear underneath or whatever. I swear that was a great thing for the fashion industry because they were able to make a lot more profit by cutting out all those linings, right? You also couldn't put a pocket in a sheer garment. So there's more money you save. We would literally be in meetings and say, we can't afford this dress, right? Like the production team would say, here's the pricing. Would say, okay, what if we shorten the skirt three inches? She would do some calculations. Be like, okay, yeah, now you can afford it. Great. So we made dresses shorter. We really loved when three quarter sleeves were in because that saved a lot of prices too. Uh, we would sub out the fabric. It's always the first thing is like, what's the cheapest fabric we can get? Like that that'll cut the price in half right there. Um, we also stopped really focusing on the fit very much. You know, typically. If you're working in a for a brand or a retailer, you know, the stuff is designed in-house. You have a series of fittings with a fit model where every time hopefully it gets a little bit better and they send the feedback back to the factory. And so there might be three, four, five, even more fittings to get it right. There's money spent creating these samples, shipping them back and forth, bringing in models. That went away. We might fit something once and be like, well, it'll fit someone. The number of times we've said that in meetings in my career is, is pretty ridiculous. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you now, if you go shopping and things don't fit you right, it has nothing to do with you. It's totally the industry's fault for not trying to make them fit you. Um, and yeah, the other thing we would do is like, if we'd already cut out the lining and made the skirt shorter and made it a short sleeve instead of a long sleeve and all the other things we could do, and it was still too expensive, we would lean on the factory and say, hey, we need this to be even cheaper, which meant they would pay the people making the clothes even less. And those that squeezing the factory on pricing, it trickles down because first it's the people who are sewing the clothes, but then it's also the people who made the fabric, right? And then it's actually the people who worked on the farm where they grew the cotton, you know, or worked in the mill where they created the polyester. Um, it, it also is the people who made the buttons, right? The people who do the inspection, the people who pack the stuff in the boxes, the people who work at the port who are shipping it and on and on and on. Ultimately, we were just left with all of this fast fashionification with a lot of poorly fitting, low quality, very short lived clothing. So the thing about fast fashion is that we'll never be sustainable. I know there are certain brands, H&M, Zara, so many others who are like, hey, it's Earth Day. Here's our sustainable stuff. Here's our special conscious collection. The model of fast fashion of remember selling us as much stuff as possible as often as possible is not sustainable, right? We are using way more resources than we should be on clothing. And the speed of it all is not sustainable either. All those airplane rides, all the low quality product that doesn't last very long and then gets you to buy some more stuff, that is not sustainable. So I said earlier, fast fashion is most brands at this point. I probably said some brands that shocked you. Uh, I always use this checklist to spot fast fashion. Uh, one, does the store or the website have hundreds or thousands of items for sale? Uh, that's a major red flag. And the reason they have so much stuff is because they want you, you can repeat it all with me if you want, to buy as much stuff as possible as often as possible. So the more selection they give you, the more likely you are to buy more stuff and come back again next week when there's even more stuff, which brings me to point number two. Does the brand, brand launch new items every week or every day? Uh, when I worked at ModCloth, every day at noon, we launched a new product, which is so much stuff as buyers. We were just like, buy, 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 like constantly looking for new stuff to buy um, so that we can have that new product every day. And we had customers who came 
back every day and placed an order. Customers who place orders multiple times a week, that's how you get well beyond 70 garments in one year, right? Um, do things seem to go on sale really fast? Uh, like, would you be embarrassed to buy something full price from this brand? You know, the reason these things go on sale so fast is one, because there's a ton more stuff coming after it and they have to make room so they can get you back shopping again and again. And reason number two is they know that most people are only going to buy these things on sale. So if it's on at full price for a little bit, it gets you filled with that desire to buy it. And then it goes on sale and you can't wait to press pay, right? Which brings me to the next one. Does the brand have a dazzling array of what I call deals, deals, deals? It's like, use this code to free shipping, get free shipping, take 20% off of this. Here's this other deal that only lasts for the next 17 minutes. That kind of stuff where it's almost confusing is definitely a red flag of fast fashion because they're just getting you to not think about what you buy so that you will just buy it and deal with it later, right? And lastly, does the brand copy or steal designs from designers or artists? Do you ever see this blowing up on the internet? Um, that happens because in order to have hundreds or thousands of new items for you constantly, they kind of run out of ideas. They don't have enough designers to make all those ideas happen. Better to just take it from someone else and keep moving, right? Um, it's actually something we're talking about a lot on the Close Source Instagram this week because it's really terrible for the designers and artists who copied because they really can't do anything about it. And ultimately it hurts their business, not the big business that took it, took the intellectual property from them. So another thing I just want to call out about fast fashion and this business model is that it cannot operate with worker exploitation. When you think about all of those airplane rides for all the stuff we buy, right? All of the low prices, you deduct all that, there's not very much money left to pay the workers. And in my experience, believe it or not, when I would look at a pricing sheet for something we were going to buy, the number one most expensive thing was fabric. The number two was the air freight. And everything else underneath, including what we were going to pay the factory, was just pennies. In fact, most workers in the factories, they get one to 3% of the, pro the price that something sells for. And remember, they're all sharing that. Everyone who did the sewing, the cutting, the packing, made the fabric, made the buttons, made the labels, all those people are just sharing these pennies for that work because most of it is going into airfare and fabric. Um, you know, the thing I want to add also is that like retailers know what they're doing when they squeeze the factories for pricing, but they do it because that's how the model works. So one thing I just want, I'm going to talk about very briefly is greenwashing. And there's a lot more information in here about it that I would urge you to go back and read, but we, you know, we're already 45 minutes into this, uh, greenwashing. I call it fake it until you never make it, which is when, Retailers pretend that something is sustainable when it really isn't. They pretend it's environmentally conscious. Greenwashing is marketing. It is not actual work towards improving the impact of the fashion industry. And greenwashing is bigger than ever right now because they know so many of us have eco-anxiety. I mean, you're here watching this presentation right now, so it's definitely on your mind, right? And it's on the minds of so many other people. And more and more people are learning that maybe there's a problem with the way the industry is working. So the industry has said, like, rather than fixing these problems, which would be a big, a big project for sure, we'll just market that things are better. Um, and what frustrates me most about greenwashing as this mis this misrepresentation this misrepresentation that something is sustainable or good for the planet is that it lets people gives us sort of the delusion that we can continue to buy as much stuff as we want as often as we want wear it very little and it will have no impact on the planet and its people right that's just not true all stuff has an impact because nothing is disposable and everything requires resources to create. But greenwashing makes us think maybe we can keep buying this stuff. Um, you know, one great example of greenwashing, which I call the most successful rebrand of all time, 
is vegan leather. I'm sure you've heard that term. Vegan leather is actually pleather. It's leather that's made of plastic. It's uh, either polyvinyl chloride or some other versions that are out there, but it's made from plastic. And early in my career, you couldn't you couldn't pay someone to buy a jacket made of pleather. Every once in a while, we could sell a handbag or a wallet, but it had to be really cheap. And we couldn't even sell faux leather shoes. People were like, gross. Well, I remember specifically seeing this faux leather jacket at a vendor showroom. This is when I was at Nasty Gal and it was covered with fringe. And I thought like, listen, this would be really great for our festival story even though it's faux leather and I know that doesn't sell, but I think it's like an affordable thing that our customer would like. And my boss at the time was like, that's disgusting. I don't think anyone would buy that. And I said, let's just try it. And she said, fine, you can buy a hundred. We'll see what happens. But I think you're going to be wrong. And I talked to the copywriter who was getting it ready to go on the site. And I said, like, listen, we have to do something really special with this because I'm never going to be allowed to just buy something I like ever again if this doesn't work. And she said, oh, well, you know what people are calling it now? They're calling it vegan leather. And I was I laughed because I was like, oh, you mean like vegan water or vegan Cheerios? This is wild. And uh, what do you know? She puts it out there as vegan leather and it sold out the same day we launched it on the site. And I do think if we hadn't called it that, it wouldn't have. And it turned into this whole thing where I was buying this massive vegan leather collection. I was developing pants and dresses and shorts and more jackets and blazers and capes and you name it. And vegan leather is one of those things that implies to you that it might be good for the planet or animals or something. Because we know that you know a vegan, a vegan diet has like a lesser impact on the planet, you know, their health benefits, all that stuff. You hear that and you're like, oh, this is a good thing for me to buy. I'm doing a good thing by buying this vegan leather jacket, but really it's going to sit in the landfill for centuries after you're done with it. And it might not last that long. So that's a great example of taking something that's not very good, but putting a more positive green spin on it and it being very successful. Uh, so the thing about greenwashing is everybody uses the same techniques. And when you start to spot them, you can't unsee them and you can be a very successful greenwashing detective. Uh, you know, one is looking for words that don't mean very much because they aren't measurable, green, eco-friendly, natural, conscious, recycled. It's true. Recycled doesn't mean much unless it's recyclable. Uh, like, can it be recycled again? And in many cases, even sustainable is used uh, kind of in an incorrect way that is misleading. Uh, beware of what I call fluffy washing, which is when brands exploit your love of animals to sell you dumb stuff. Vegan leather is a great example, but I remember a few years ago, Shein did a weird, like, save the animals campaign where they sold you a lot of clothes and donated a few cents to a zoo or something. Uh, I know H&M did a thing with PETA. There's a lot of that out there. Uh, don't let them trick you with a ton of fancy sounding certifications and organizations. There's a lot of that. I always just Google the name of it and the term greenwashing, and I usually get my results pretty fast that it is. Um, also, a lot of these certifications and organizations that brands will show you as proof that they're sustainable. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is real. Most of them were created by the industry themselves. Um, and it's sort of like, telling your kids that they can pick what time they go to bed. It usually doesn't work out very well, right? There's corruption for sure. Um, that's kind of the similar thing with a lot of these certifications and organizations. Uh, beware of ad bluster. So this is one, since I learned about it, it's a term coined by Greenpeace, I can't unsee. And it's when a brand will just bombard you with ads and press. You'll read about it on every blog, in the newspaper, maybe it'll be on the Today Show on and on and on. Nike does this a lot where they'll be like, look at this recycled shoe and everybody writes about it. Then you take a step back and you're like, if you can make one recycled shoe, which is just one tiny part of the millions of shoes that Nike makes and sells every year, why can't you make all your shoes recycled or recyclable, right? That's, that's the real question. Um, and often what Greenpeace found in their research of this is that brands were spending more money on these marketing campaigns than they were on the actual good deed that they were doing. Um, and also like the last one, I'll just call it is don't get caught up in the one green aspect of our business. Like they might say, oh, like we use recyclable packaging or we use LED light bulbs or we give back 
this 1% or something, but like, what else do they do? Like, what do they walk the walk fully? Uh, there are lots of ways that you can uh, keep up and learn more as a greenwashing detective. Um, there are some great resources out there on the internet that are free, the Fashion Revolution Transparency Index. You can check out Eco Stylist. Remake has a lot of really great information. Uh, don't ever feel weird about asking brands for the details. Google is also a great friend. And just remember, like, it's progress, not perfection. I'm actually really excited about brands that are like, here's where we are, here's where we're going. We're not perfect, but we're working on getting better. That means a lot more than me to me than like, whoa, look at this recycled shoe we made. And it's like, you're like, oh, you only made like a hundred. That doesn't seem very helpful. So I am realistic about what brands can do and cannot do, but I also don't like when they're dishonest about things. The most important thing to remember is that it's not sustainable if it isn't good for both the planet and its people. And as I said, when we started, a lot of conversation about out there about sustainability and like really all of this greenwashing is always focused on like, oh, this is this special fabric that is recycled or, or uses less water or is organic, but no one says, yeah, but like, what about the people who sewed? that shirt, right? They don't talk about that stuff. And that's just as important. Do we have any questions, Cassie? Nope, we're good. Great. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of water. Hopefully by now, you're all really riled up or panicking, which is fine too, uh, or just spiraling. Uh, the good news is like, there are so many things that you as an individual can do. And I know that sometimes it feels like, well, I'm just one person. I'm like this little grain of, grain of sand in this huge desert. Like, how could I have an impact? And I will tell you that how major change happens is on the individual level with more and more people making changes at the same time. We've seen all kinds of massive social trends, economic trends, political trends happening from the individuals doing their best and, you know, being the trendsetters in their sphere of influence. So first off is change your habits. We shall shop for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I had this one job where I was just depressed. Every day at lunch, I would sit down and open Zara and order something. And then every time it arrived, I would return it. In fact, I would try it on and I would get even more depressed and then buy even more. Uh, we gotta change those habits. We have been sold this idea that retail therapy is a real thing that will make you feel better and it is therapy somehow. It's actually not. Uh, buy less, um, there's a typo in there, I'm mortified. Uh, buy less and make it last longer, right? Like impulse shopping is where fast fashion really thrives is like getting us to not think about it. And then we get it and we realize, oh, to wear that thing, I need to buy like a special bra and special tights and special shoes and a bag and a different coat and on and on and on. And then you barely wear it after you bought all the other things to support it. Rather like taking that time to slow it down and really thinking about it and how it fits into your life is it's kind of a game changer. It saves you a lot of money and it kind of saves you frustration. Also, learning how to repair things is a great skill to have. Um, if you don't have that skill, there are people, all, all kinds of incredible makers and sewists on social media who offer workshops or just pay someone else to do the mending for you. Uh, do, really caring about laundry. We talk about laundry an awful lot on Clothes Horse. Um, I'm obsessed with laundry um, because that's really where you can make the simplest impact on extending the life of your clothing is just how you wash and care for it. Uh, be a proud outfit repeater. Show other people that yes, you can wear the same thing all the time, that you don't need to buy a whole new outfit for every wedding, every vacation, every birthday, every party, you, you, the list goes on, right? Um, if you have a favorite brand that you feel like is not doing a great job, it's time to speak up and it's not trolling to speak up. I think many of us have this fear that if you ask questions or just speak up about a concern you have, that maybe you're being rude or you're trolling. And I'm here to tell you, you're not. And what you're actually doing is not only getting conversations started within those companies about how they can do better. Other people see what you said, hear what you said, 
and they start thinking about it too, which is also amazing. I would just also say, vote with your wallet, try to whenever you can, shop small, shop with brands that reflect your values. Um, there are tools out there like Eco Stylist and Good On You that can help you find anything from shoes to underwear to jeans to sweatshirts, very specific things on some of these websites that will uh, you know, be like, let have a lesser impact on the planet and pay ethical wages. Another really important thing that you can do is thoughtfully rehome your unwanted clothing or any unwanted stuff. You know, rather than just dropping it off at the Goodwill, which sends a lot of that stuff to the landfill or overseas because they get way too much to deal with, you could donate to a shelter, a local charity, you could rehome it in your local buy nothing group. I'm a huge fan of that. You could have a yard sale, you could have a clothing swap with your friend, you could sell things online secondhand, which is a great segue into this one, the secondhand first approach which is looking for something secondhand before buying it brand new. There's so many places to shop. I think people hear secondhand and they immediately think thrift stores. Of course, there are also flea markets, yard sales. I'm a yard sale maniac. Estate sales are pretty fun too. Vintage shops, antique malls. Let me tell you, kind of the best place for finding if you're like more into vintage, whether it's like home goods or clothing, antique malls. They sound fancy. They sound expensive, but actually they're frequently just booths of different small businesses and resellers and the prices are good and you'll find all kinds of incredible stuff and you get to uh, support some, a small business owner. Consignment stores are great if you're looking for more contemporary clothing. Often this stuff is barely worn, if at all. Most consignment stores only take the highest quality stuff. Uh, you can shop online for on Poshmark, which is really great if you have a specific brand. I have a friend who will go to the mall, find something she likes, get all the details, literally walk out of the store and go on to Poshmark, search it, find it used, get it immediately for a quarter of the price. The Real Real is great if you like luxury. Thread Up is awesome for kids and casual wear. There's a lot on there, but the prices are very good. Depop is good if you're looking for more of like a trendy kind of vibe. Mercari is like my, my secret. It's a great place for all things secondhand of all categories. Etsy, uh, eBay is another one. Uh, Vinted, there are so many places to buy things secondhand that uh, without leaving your couch, basically. Um, I would also, you can consider renting special occasion wear, which is great too, because how many of us need yet another bridesmaid's dress or cocktail dress or what have you? And of course, shopping small and shopping local is so important, has such a major impact on your community. When you spend $100 at a small business, $48 stays in your community. You spent that same $100 at Target or Best Buy or Nordstrom Rack, whatever, only $14 will stay in the community. So it's a big impact just by doing that. And small businesses create jobs in a massive way that big businesses don't. So that's another way to fuel your local economy. Um, and, you know, most importantly, continue to learn more, to educate yourself, to share your knowledge with others. That's how we get a critical mass of people who are all making these changes at the same time and have a major impact on how this industry works, uh, the impact on the planet, and really ensure that they're kind of forced to do better, right? Um, I will say as a person who's worked as a buyer for so long, for so many different businesses at this point, only two things ever forced us to make changes in what we were doing. One was the law, um, and two was the fear of losing sales or actually seeing lower sales play out. Um, that's what would really get us to make a change as well. And so I think there are a lot of great ways where you can get involved on a local level, also on a state and federal level in terms of uh, grassroots uh, campaigns and lobbying for more regulation of the fashion industry. But I also think that uh, just like abstaining from it is going to have a major impact on what these brands do next. Um, I'll just say lastly, there's a ton of links in here for you to take a look at, uh, some other stuff here. And so please take a look at this when you get it in your inbox. Uh, questions? I see that there are some now. 
Yeah, um, so we do have a few. So the first one is, how do we find out about who is actually sewing for the brand? That is a great question. And I wish I had an easy answer um, because the reality is that most retailers do not know who is sewing for the brand. Why is that? Because of subcontracting. So most retailers do not own the factories that make their stuff. And when I started my career, that was one of the most surprising things that I learned. I assumed I'm working for a huge company. We must have tons of factories. No, uh, we. what we would do is work through agents who sort of handled the communication back and forth, negotiated the pricing and got the factory for us. But it's not like we knew the factory, the factory owners. We didn't know what the factory looked like. Uh, and they would basically work out the contract with the factory for us, right? But then the factory could subcontract that out to someone else who might subcontract it out to someone else beyond that. Uh, early in the days of Close Horse, I had my friend Selena Sanders on, and she talked about her time working for a company that made sandals, among other things. And she went, there was a major quality issue, right? And she was overseas anyway, doing some factory visits, some product development. And they said, hey, will you go to the factory and look at the production and figure out what is going on here? She goes to the factory and all the shoes look fine. But then someone says, oh, that's not all of them. And she said, yeah, it doesn't look like it. We ordered 10,000 units. There can only be like a quarter of it here. And they said, okay, hold on. So they take her in the car. They drive to this small town where literally people are sitting outside making the shoes. Um, they looked totally different. They were getting dirty because they were making them outside. Uh, all, whole families there just making these shoes because the contract, the order that the company, the retailer placed was far too large for that factory to complete yeah. on the, in the time frame that the retailer wanted. And so they subcontracted it out to this other factory who was like, hey, we're just giving it to all these people in the town to make. Um, you know, more than 10 years ago, there was a devastating uh, factory disaster. Uh, it's called Rana Plaza. And literally the factory collapsed and there were a lot, it was mostly garment uh, manufacturers in there and many people died and were injured. And, you know, as people are going in there and doing the investigation, they start seeing labels from Gap and Old Navy and Macy's and Kohl's and so many other brands. And all of these retailers were like, we had no idea that our stuff was being made in those factories. Um, because it was subcontracted out so many times. And that is another problem with this industry is that there is not a lot of transparency and they don't know who's making their stuff. And so that's why things like factories collapsing or whole families sitting outside making sandals happens. Uh, I think there are some retailers who are working really hard or trying to, to get a full grasp of their supply chain, but you will find that in most cases, they can't go deeper than the final factory that does the finishing or the first factory that they offered the contract to. Um, and this like subcontracting will probably never stop because the timelines that these retailers are giving to the factories are basically unachievable, which is why they subcontract the workout to other people. So that was a really long, I guess, long-winded answer to say that we, as consumers, in most cases, cannot find out who is actually sewing for the brand unless we work through, we buy from like a smaller business. Um, I, I see another question here. Can you name some brands or stores that are not fast fashion? Um, not very many. I don't give, I never tell people where to shop, right? Because really the least important part of all this is the actual shopping. And the most important thing is the not shopping. But I would urge you to go check out Fashion Revolution, to go on to Eco Stylist and good on you. They have a lot of brands that they have vetted that pay a living wage, that try to be as sustainable as possible in terms of like, you know, energy usage and water waste and all of these other things. And they rate them in a variety of different ways. And they have covered just about any category of product that you're looking for. I personally don't like send people to brands to shop because I try to only shop secondhand. And so I don't really, I don't have any experience buying any of those brands, but I would urge you to just go check out those websites. They've really 
thoroughly vetted them. And uh, one great thing that I've noticed is when I started working on Close Horse three years ago, there were not that many options on these sites and they kind of all looked the same. Uh, and there's so many more options now. Like this is this is picking up momentum for sure. And uniforms, it's really fun. Um, the first, I would say like the first 20 episodes of Close Horse are really about how the industry works. And we've been expanding into all kinds of other topics over the last few years that tie back into that and how we can change the world together.